And the rationale for data sharing that, that we work with at Science Commons is that data gets more powerful if it gets linked up, if it gets connected. And this is sort of a fundamental principle of networks, which is that when you connect things, they tend to get more valuable if they're at least digital assets. But to do for data what we've done for the web and what we've done for computers with Ethernet and TCP IP and HTML uh, takes more infrastructure than we currently have, and it takes a fair amount of innovation. Remember the name of this isn't just open data, it's open data and the future of funded research. And funded research means that for the most part, unlike web pages and internet servers, science and knowledge and data get created in institutions that get funded by funding organizations. And so there are different opportunities for control at each layer of the stack that don't really operate on the web and on the network. They don't operate on eBay, but they operate on data. The law was designed for copyrighted works of knowledge, for patented works of knowledge, for trademarks that represented brands, for trade secrets. It wasn't designed for this really weird world in which there were gigabytes and exabytes of data linked up by computer networks. And what you find is that over and over again when you deal with this that you can't meet the expectations for data that have been generated for software and for culture, which is the expectation that you can force people to behave nicely through the law. And it's going to be relatively cheap for you to do that. And that's a power that comes from copyright that we just don't really have in data. So what we've been doing is working on the public domain as the substrate for data. We have this thing that we came with a very sexy title for, which is the Protocol for Implementing Open Access to Data. And the whole idea behind this is interoperability of scientific data. And the idea is no law rather than free law. The idea is that you want first to waive all of the rights that are necessary for extraction and reuse. So there are copyright things that attach to pieces of databases, like the way they look and the way that you load data in. So you need to waive those so that your user doesn't have to figure out where the copyright stops and starts. You don't impose obligations, even ones that would, in theory, make it more free to limit downstream use. Because in the beginning of a web, any friction is too much friction. And the way to deal with this is to request behavior through norms. So the human genome is our example here. The human genome is in the public domain. And the scientists who participate in the projects related to the Human Genome Project use norms to guarantee compliance and behavior as opposed to the law. So, uh, one thing that's happening is uh, uh, lots of people are investing a lot in collecting more data. So uh, hundreds of satellites in planning. NASA has a whole new set of missions planned for the next decade or two. Uh, lots of data being collected, but in the traditional mode, all very stovepiped. So, you know, a uh, country or a, a company or whatever collects the data f to sell or to uh, make available to it their own researchers, not necessarily share. And so uh, there is an international initiative called the Group on Earth Observations, which is trying to develop uh, a unified global system, something they call GEOS, still under development, not really uh, there yet. Um, but uh, it's an effort to get these stovepipes to interoperate so uh, within GEO, there's a set of data sharing principles that were established um, up front, and, and they're kind of good. They call for full and open exchange of data. But the fine print does say, you know, recognizing relevant international instruments and national policies and legislation. So it's always a fine print of legal documents that kill you, right? So uh, one of the efforts that I've been involved in is uh, to uh, develop implementation guidelines for these uh, general principles. And, you know, one of the points was really, sure, there are reasonable and necessary exceptions, protecting uh, indigenous peoples, protecting endangered species, confidentiality, and so forth. But you want the exceptions to be exceptions, not huge things that, you know, everybody uses to get around what is ostensibly open. What we want is to establish or, or or make the claim that these are public goods, the data about the polls are public goods, that they ought to be shared, um, and that we need both the institutional legal framework as well as the technical framework to enable sharing of data. 
and that uh, we really need to take the internet um, model that's developed, uh, John alluded to, of, of really collective, you know, grassroots uh, ability to, to put effort and time and resources in to creating this without putting a lot of legal and uh, other constraints on it. This is my last example. We've been studying childhood asthma and street trees. So New York City has a census of street trees. The idea is if a tree falls in the city, somebody's got to go pick it up and plant a new tree, so they need to know where the trees are. And so here we've combined data on asthma prevalence from DOH with a density of street trees. And what we found is that across neighborhoods in New York City, a one standard deviation increase in trees is associated with a 23% lower prevalence of asthma. And so New York City is about to plant a million new trees on the streets. And so this kind of information is very helpful for them in thinking about where they're going to plant trees. Um, you know, to underlie this, we had to, find, we had to discover there was, in fact, a Department of Forestry in New York City and then reach an agreement with them to give us the data on the location of all trees. They wouldn't actually even give us the location, the exact location of the trees. They would just tell us the number of trees on each block. For some reason, the actual location of the trees in our initial, in our initial relationship was um, not something that was going to be available to us. Since then, we have a much better working relationship with them, and we are now allowed to know not only the location of the trees, but the width of the tree and the gender of the tree. And so by combining these sort of administrative data sets that are being collected routinely by city agencies, combining them with health data, we can start to understand how neighborhood characteristics affect health in the city. And this kind of data is then fed back to city agencies who are making all kinds of planning decisions about how to improve the city. And we provide them this sort of clues as to how they can improve public health through these kind of data analyses. And this is data that's collected with our tax dollars. And there is no systematic way to go about accessing it. And it's an enormous burden to negotiate these kinds of agreements and keep track of all of the licensing arrangements that you've negotiated to get your hands on this data. And then once you have the data, there's this issue of what is my responsibility as the researcher to further disseminate this data to other research groups. Um, and there's two types of data. There's the raw data. And then there's the valid value-added measurements that I have created from that raw data that represent the creative manipulation of data or the layering of multiple data units together to generate a value-added um, measure. You know, this data forms the basis of my research programs, my grant applications, and my publications, which translates into promotions and tenure for myself and for my colleagues who work with me. So what is my motivation to share the data that I've created or licensed or spent days and days and days schmoozing to get with another research group. You know, when I went up for my last promotion, we talked about my publications, my teaching record. Never once did anybody suggest to me that, uh, you know, I would get credit for depositing data in the library or sharing the data with another research group. It's not part of the reward structure under which we're operating. Uh, in terms of funding agencies, what we've seen is that the funders have the most leverage to change the system, um, as well as the institutions. Andrew raised a great point, which is that you never get asked for your data impact factor. Uh, you don't get judged on the use and the utility of the systems you create. You get judged on these sort of knowledge artifacts that you create. And the NIH moving to force open access to the literature that it funds is one step. Um, the NIH, for, for most projects over a certain funding level, requires a data sharing plan, but then the data sharing plans are typically not part of the peer review process. So it's, it is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit more like plain ice. But the bigger the science, the more likely it is that sharing is mandated. And what's interesting from what Andrew is talking about is this is, an this is you know, a small group of people hacking away and trying to come up with it. There's no infrastructure to then republish the data the way we have for the human genome or the polar information commons. 